My name is Charles Mott. I'm the Associate Director with the DC Small Business Development Center. Just want to let you know this webinar will be recorded and posted on our website. Um, welcome to the webinar today. This is the third in a three-part series on the food business. And once again, we have a great facilitator today. Hopefully you've had a chance to enjoy the last two webinars that we've had. Um, I'm not going to take up any more of her time, but I'm going to let her go ahead and, and jump in and um, you're in for a treat. And uh, Caroline will also have her contact information available in on the um, on one of the slides so you can get in touch with her. So without further ado, Carolina, please take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Thank you always for those great <laughs> introductions. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Um, today we are in part three of the three part series of um, these webinars and I'm going to stop share real quick so I can see your faces but um, okay I see your names but I don't see your faces but let me there you are hi everybody hi Jordan how you doing? <laughs> Hi, Christine and Alexis. It's so nice to see people that I see, you know, that I recognize from the program. That always makes me so excited. Um, and especially because I know, I know what phase you are in, in your, within your businesses. So then I can try to apply a lot of this information to um, things that you can benefit from. Uh, today's going to be super important because we're talking all about scaling your business and growing your business in a sustainable way. And also, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about menu development, because um, since we started these, um, these webinars, I've been, you know, meeting with a lot of you individually. And I have heard you kind of um, ask about Okay, Carolina, um, I get about, so last, last webinar, we talked about systematizing and technology. So making sure that we're able to integrate all of our systems and have a very manageable way of doing the admin in our businesses, uh, which for food businesses, classically, um, you know, we've been, we've really relied within the industry on paper type uh, situation. So not, we don't really use too much technology in the smaller mom and pop shops and micro businesses. And it was to stress the importance of as you grow out of this, you know, micro and small business phase and you go into growing your business, that part is essential. It's not really something that is optional anymore. If you want to compete, especially with um, established businesses, um, and also, if you want to surpass those businesses, you have to have that technology in line. So that was our last webinar that we spoke about. So should you have any questions about that, um, I'm going to also leave a little bit of time at the end of this session today to answer any questions. And then also, if you have any questions as I go along, please put them in the chat. And then the webinar that we did before we talked about the technology was about identifying opportunity. Um, so a lot of us, um, if you already have your businesses that have been open, you already know this, but when we write a business plan, we write it with the intention of what project we're going to execute, right? So we're like, okay, this is, this is my product line. This is what I want to do. So I'm going to write a plan for that. But whenever you're in the day to day and you actually open your business and you're and you're getting it rolling, you start noticing that sometimes your customers influence what you're going to offer. So your business plan shifts a little. Um, it doesn't always happen, but it happens more often than not. That's one of the biggest things that I've noticed in um, you know, small businesses, but even, you know, established restaurants, you'll open with a certain vision and then the customer will kind of dictate what, what you're going to be. Um, a lot of people are kind of against that and they say, no, I'm going to stick to my vision and I'm going to stick to what I want it to be. 
And that's very good. Um, however, I kind of take a different approach. I, I tend to develop my product, offer it and see how it goes. And then based on that, you know, you might be able to scale your business in something that's more successful within your business. So maybe you have a certain product um, that, or a certain, yeah, a certain type of product within your product line that's more popular and then you expand your business with that. So maybe you started as a restaurant and then you decided to sell uh, salsas and then you decided to expand your business by selling bottled salsas and you know be able to get them into grocery stores as you still run your restaurant. So something that started off as a restaurant then became you know, a salsa company. Uh, that actually did happen. I think I told you guys the story of Jack's Garden Salsa in Michigan, um, but I used that story as an example because they got bought out by Campbell's Soup. And, you know, I don't think that they ever expected to open a Mexican restaurant. And the salsa became super popular. They started jarring it in these big jars. They started selling it. Then they said, okay, this is really popular. How do we get this into grocery stores? And then it, you know, was in grocery stores and then they got picked up by a, you know, very, very large company. So what's this, what I'm trying to say, you know, in, um, I guess in short is that the first webinar that we talked about identifying opportunity is extremely important, but as you move forward, this third part is now about scaling and understanding, okay, when something is popular or when I identify something, how do I grow my business in a way that's not going to um, really hurt me financially? Uh, because sometimes that happens too, where people will not expect, um, or, or maybe they overshoot their projections and they think that they're gonna sell more than what they did and they invested too much in inventory or um, you know maybe they decided to scale but they didn't line up their purchase orders so then they lost a lot of the inventory by the time they were going to go you know sell it so there are a lot of different types of problems that can go along with it um, I'm going to start with restaurants though because we have a few restaurants here and um for restaurants, and this is actually true for distributable goods as well. This is true for everything. Um, I'm gonna pull up this chart. So this is something that is, um, the exercise is called the menu mix. So as you design a menu, any food business, this isn't just uh, restaurants actually, it can be your, your product catalog for something that you're trying to sell wholesale. It can be your online store, but when it's a food business, especially, but I think this is true for, you know, for many different types of businesses, not just food, you have to have a proper menu mix. You have to make sure that although your, your, your products should all be profitable, that's true. But sometimes in your product line, you have some items that are more profitable than other items. You have some items that are more popular and they sell better than other items. Uh, so whenever you're designing your menu and you're figuring out the list of what you're going to offer, you want to make sure you have a healthy mix of these items because if you have, let's say, too many things that are lower profit margin, then you're going to really uh, hurt yourself a little bit in as you sell um, or, you know, as you sell, what do you market more? Because if you're marketing the item that already sells well, that's a lower profit margin, you're kind of waste, not wasting your energy, but you should be placing your energy in maybe different places on your menu as far as how you design it and what you sell and also where you place it in your menu or on your website um, is important because if it's something that doesn't sell as quickly or if it's something that's more difficult to sell or a little less popular 
you would want to make it more visible, right? And then the more very super popular item, you maybe want to, you know, you don't use that real estate um, and you put it somewhere else. Uh, so this chart, um, how many people, just out of curiosity, because this is actually a super popular chart, um, how many people have seen this chart before? Just raise your hand if you've seen it before. No? Okay. Well, that's good because this is actually an exercise that really helped me a lot in, in my career. So what we have here is we have a puzzle, a star, a plow horse, and this section is called the dog, but I have an issue with that because I love dogs and dogs are like the best animal in the world. So I don't believe that this section should be called a dog. So I'm going to call it a snail or something that's a little, you know, more representative of the section, but I'll explain it. So the puzzle, or well, let me explain this part first. So the contribution margin is um, like your profit margin, you know, so things that, you know, this would be the profit rising, and then this would be the popularity growing. So for the puzzle, for example, when you have a menu item that's a puzzle, it means that it's something that's not popular. So it's unpopular, but it has a high profit margin. So on your menu, you're probably going to have something that people order a little less, but you make a lot more money on. Um, so you can kind of think within your, your own menus what that would be. For me, typically, that's like uh, things that are a little less popular that I make more money on typically tend to be things like, for example, lentils, or there are different menu items that you can offer that might be a little bit less of something, yeah, super popular, super, super, profitable, usually like there's grains or sides or things like that. Sometimes there's dishes that have to do with that. And then in a, in a, um, in a product line, like let's say you were doing a distributable good, you don't really want an unprofitable item with, uh, with, you know, you don't really want an unpopular item in general, but, um, typically like, let's say you were to have an online store, uh, teas tend to be something like that, for example, um, when people sell bag teas, sometimes they need different items to kind of push and they still want to offer the item on, as a product within their menu mix, but it's something that you know it's going to be more difficult to sell. And when you have something that's so a little bit more difficult to sell or something that somebody's not going to order yeah, as quickly, then you have something like a star to balance your menu out. Um, a star would be something that you sell a lot of, and it's a higher profit margin as well. Um, you know, a lot of times in food, um, in restaurants, for example, that tends to be like maybe like a pulled pork sandwich. That's what that was for me. It was something that was a higher profit margin for me, and then also. Um, it was incredibly popular. I didn't really have to push it <laughs> because it was going to sell out anyway. But because it was going to sell out, I still needed other items to complement that item in my menu. So that's why sometimes people say, well, Carolina, why wouldn't you make everything a star? And I'm like, well, that's really, really it, you know, you have your own um, business. You want to offer all kinds of things and you just have to know each thing's place, but it doesn't mean that because something's unpopular, um, but I make some money on it, I don't wanna sell it. I might still wanna offer it. I just need to make sure that there's enough of those profitable items and know exactly you know, what, what that mix is. Um, and then we have the dog here. You know, like I said, uh, they said they call this section the dog, and the dog is a representative of an unpopular item with a low profit margin. So that's why I call this like a snail or something because like dogs are the best, and I don't understand why 
they're in the unpopular section with a low profit or a low contribution margin because um yeah but anyway that's called the dog but i call it you know the slug or the snail and those unpopular items with a lower profit margin it's important to identify them you don't need to remove them from your product line or your menu mix um, immediately if you're still making money off of them and then typically also sometimes this section is where you're utilizing um, not the waste but yeah like the trim or the items from other things like let's say for example um, you're producing something you know some a menu and you have um, a vegetable and you have a lot of vegetable trim and you want to utilize all that trim and perhaps pickle it or make a chutney or do something with it so you don't take that um, usable food and throw it in the trash and that way you can add something to your menu um, and you can you know have something unique and then you don't have to waste as much in your in your business so those items sometimes they're super ultra popular but most of the time they tend to be a little bit less popular and low profit margin maybe it depends on labor actually when you're utilizing trim from other products it tends to make it more profitable so maybe that wasn't the best example but uh, sometimes it's actually low profit margin as well because of labor and the time it takes you to take something and, you know, produce and, and make something out of it as opposed to, you know, just throwing it away. Um, but in any food business in general, any food business, it doesn't matter if you're a restaurant or if you're producing um, granola bars or if you're producing juice. You always want to make sure that you're utilizing everything for a few reasons. Uh, one big one would be the, um, I guess, the social responsibility of having a food business and making sure that you're not co contributing to a lot of waste, um, especially as you grow your business, making sure that you can promote healthy values like sustainability and uh, circularity and things that are benefiting others. And that way you can also show that with your business, you're doing a, a positive thing. Um, but then on another, on another side, you know, it tends to bring down your food costs because you're utilizing everything. Um, and then the last section here is the plow horse. Couldn't find a good picture for a plow horse, so I used a chariot. But I don't like this. I don't like these 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 descriptors actually, and I kind of want to change it. But this is the industry thing, so you need to know the, <laughs> the these terms. But I'm not in love with it. I love horses too, so I'm not a big fan of calling it a plow horse. But the plow horse is a very popular item. That's a low profit margin. So you don't make tons of money on it, but it's incredibly popular. Um, you know, so that's something that sometimes you have to make that compromise. So when we're doing menu design, we're looking at um, what's the perceived value of my product and what are people going to buy, um, buy it for? Like how much can I sell this for? So you have a few different methods of determining what how much you're gonna sell something for and how you're gonna price your menu. You have the competitive analysis, which I, I always like to do. I make sure I know how much it's costing me to produce the food and how much I would like to sell it for. But then I research and I look at businesses around my business and see, okay, well, you know, this restaurant's also selling a pulled pork sandwich and they're selling it at, you know, eight dollars and i know i want to sell my pulled pork sandwiches i i want to sell it at 12 but maybe i'll sell it at 10 just to be a little bit more competitive but i know i'm using better quality ingredients or whatnot so that's why i'm going to sell it for more um, but making sure it has a, a solid perceived value what you don't want is if you do decide okay i'm going to sell my sandwich for this 
you know, you have to be realistic about um, your market. And that's why you do a market analysis and why it's so important to look around the um, where your business is and look at what your who your, your potential customer is because you need to know are these people that uh, will have the expendable income for them to frequent my business over and over again or even if it's not a restaurant and you want to do online subscriptions or you want to sell um, snacks online how do you make your product habitual to people how do you make it part of their lifestyle or your food part of their lifestyle as opposed to not part of their lifestyle as opposed to you know they it could be something that they have on a special occasion but then you only get them you know get their business a few times a year as opposed to a weekly routine which is what what the idea is to do is to build that clientele and that habitual customer so when you're doing that the competitive analysis is really important so looking at who your competition is and how much they're charging and trying to you can decide to beat them or you can say okay my product is better so this is how i'm going to communicate that to the customer so that they pay just a little extra for what i'm offering um, so the menu mix itself this is an exercise. This is something that if you would like to um, work with me one-on-one -on -one through you know, our time with the DCS BDC, we, can, we will go over, we design menus and then we go over making sure that you have a healthy menu mix because no matter what, your menu items are gonna fall on, under one of these categories. And so you wouldn't want the majority of the items that you're offering to be dogs, for example, which again, I don't like to call them dogs, but let's call them like a slug or something. Like you don't want them to be this bottom corner right here. You want maybe like, if you have 10 items on your menu, maybe two might fall under this section. And then you might have you know, the profit, obviously you want things that are higher profit. So the majority of your items on your menu should fall under these two categories. Um, they're either, you know, not incredibly popular, but they make you a, a lot of profit or they're super popular and, you know, they make you a lot of profit. They're stars, but, you know, it's life and nothing's perfect. So things are going to be fall under one of these. And the idea is you want to make sure that you're as strategic as possible in how you place your menu items. So menu analysis is extremely important, not just for restaurants, but this also falls well under any wholesale company or any company that's selling a product in general. But with food, when you have a catalog, for example, and you're selling to a corporation, for, or let's say you're selling to a distributor and you want to sell your food item to the distributor and you wanna get your items on that shelf so that they can um, sell it to different restaurants. You better be putting things that people are gonna order. Um, so know your, know your product line and make sure that as you design your catalog, you're putting you're being analytical as to what you're putting in your catalog and what the placement is. Um, so it seems like a very simple chart, but it's actually something that's pretty loaded with um, information. So I'm going to um, stop share real quick just to see who's here and um, does anybody have any questions about menu mix or that section that I just went over? Nope. Okay, cool. Well then I will- Carolina, we have a, a fairly small group here. So um, I know I said put a, put your questions in the chat area, but if you're, if you're comfortable with it, we can also take uh, uh, audio questions too. 
Um, well, I'm comfortable with it, with audio questions, definitely. But if nobody has a question, I can definitely keep going because sometimes also you might want to ask me the questions one-on-one, -on -one, which I totally understand. And that is totally fine, especially because everyone's situation is pretty different, right? Because I have people here who have, um, you know, do online sales. I have people here who have food stands, who are looking to design a restaurant. So we have all these different situations. I'm happy to go over this with you one-on-one. -on -one. So as we work in the SBDC, um, a lot of you might actually be familiar with, um, with this other form that I'm going to share with you because I've worked on it with a lot of you, but some of you haven't worked with me on this yet. So this is something that I do with all of everyone. Um, I assign it as homework. It's one of the first things that we do. And the most important thing about this is that you need to know how much it costs you to produce your recipe, period. Okay, period. Like, <laughs> I can't stress enough that you need to know your food cost. That's it. There's no like, oh, but I just eyeball things and I like to cook with my soul. Then no, because this is a business. So, you know, I love all of you and I, I, I love passion. I'm a chef. I love cooking with passion. I definitely cook with, with my soul as well. You know, I, I have recipes, but then sometimes like I'm in a mood and I want to like do something a little different because cooking is an art also, and it's a form of expression. And I clearly am a super expressive person and I let myself out through food. It's always been that thing for me. And maybe that's why I'm, I, I've been so good at it. But the business side is your business. You know, that's what's paying your bills. That's what is covering your costs. That's what's going to help you grow. So you need to have this. This is one of the most difficult things for me to get people to actually do. So I, I really, you know, thank everyone whenever they do it because it's it's something that you have to do. And the reason you have to do it is because of the menu mix thing that I just mentioned. If you think that you're making a profit off of something and you're selling a ton of it, but you're actually losing money when you sell it, you're in trouble because if you don't have a strong menu mix to where you have enough of those stars that are making you that profit and selling a ton, then you're you're going backwards. You're gonna you're gonna fail because you're not making enough cash. So you might have money in, in to buy inventory, but then by the time you sell, you wonder, oh, where did all my money go? And a lot of the time it goes in like the silliest things, like that extra sauce that people order, or that um, you know, little giveaway that you do to your friends which you shouldn't do, but you do because it always happens. And you need to make sure that you're, 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 you're the mix of what you're selling is going to be profitable enough to keep everything going, right? And thrive. I don't just want people to live day to day. I want them to be able to grow those finances, have extra cash flow, invest your cash flow and keep growing your cash flow. Like that's that's how you grow your business in a safe way. So for the recipe costing template, that's incredibly important. So I'll kind of go over how we fill it out a little bit here, but this is something that we do one-on-one. -on -one. This is something that takes a while. I'm sorry. Um, Every time I do this with somebody, it takes about one hour to teach you how to do it. And then you go and you do it on your own and you fill out your food costing. And then we go back and I help you with it if you have any trouble with it. Um, 
something very important is as you're filling out your food costs here, knowing that you need to try to source from a distributor. <laughs> that is very important to get wholesale prices for your food business. So you're not using pricing that you're getting at the grocery store. Even Restaurant Depot, I'm not a big fan of because you have to drive to Restaurant Depot to go there. You have to drive there. Then you have to drive back to your kitchen. Then you have to put it in the walk-in. Then you can start working. So it's like, how valuable is your time? Because that takes forever. You know, that takes hours. Um, takes hours to go there. And sometimes it's worth it. But most of the time, it's way better to set up a wholesale account with a distributor. If you have trouble with that, also, that's another thing that we do um, at the SBDC. You can contact me, say, Carolina, I have this kind of business and I need to set up some wholesale accounts. And so we'll kind of go through, okay, well, what kind of business, you know, is this? And we figure out what you need and, and how you can best purchase things wholesale. As much as you can purchase directly from the person producing it, the better. Um, so we also work with, or at least I also work with a lot of local farms. So if what you're looking to do is either source locally or source wholesale, but something that is from a smaller company or made from scratch, or then maybe you need something that's a little bit uh, lower cost that you know has a different type of product line. We work trying to figure out who, what distributors you need and how to set up that account. But whenever you create this form, uh, this is something that you need to have those prices. So we would create that relationship first and then try to fill out this uh, to the best of our ability. Now, a lot of wholesalers offer this type of template already in with their, um, their programs. For example, Cisco and US Foods um, both offer their recipe costing in the program of when you order the food. So that way, if there are any price fluctuations with both Cisco and US Foods, it'll automatically calculate it so that you always know your food cost. But then, then you have to think about your strategy, right? Because especially for catering or for things where you're ordering um, for the thousands, you know, sometimes we'll have an event and maybe it's for, you know, 1200 people or maybe it's, you know, for, you know, a couple thousand people, um, you're going to have a really big order. So I don't really love depending on one distributor because I like having them kind of work for my business in the sense that I'm shopping around. I'll have maybe, you know, I'll have four of my main guys, my main sales reps, and I will have my order. And I'll email it to them and say, okay, can you please come back to me with the pricing for this list of items? And then I'm strategic about it. Then I get the pricing. And then, okay, maybe PFG might offer these, you know, the, these items that I really need at a lower price than Cisco does. And I need this caliber of items for this. But then I'm also, I want to, you know, get the meat or these things from this local farm. So maybe I might get like, a, you know, tortillas or something from PFG, but I might get the, the chicken and the pork from Polyface Farms. And then I get some paper goods over from Cisco. So I just divide the order a lot of different ways. But the key is that they deliver to me. And they always will, like distributors will deliver to you. So this is why I like it a lot more than Restaurant Depot. Because you have a list, a network of people that you're building a relationship with that'll work for your business, 
they'll offer you, you know, different products, even when they have different products and, and really feeding that relationship with your purveyors is incredibly important because that'll allow you to be able to not only control your costs, it'll allow you to negotiate your costs and also get, be in the know of what's the newest things going on. Um, and it'll save you a ton of time. You don't need to go all the way there because that's a headache. You're like in line. You, there's so many better things that you can do with your time um, than to try, drive all over the place for ingredients. Um, so then you visit the recipe costing template. And this template, like I said, it's not hooked up to any other programs. It's just an Excel spreadsheet that I got in college that I treasure and I use you know, for, you know, over a decade now. Um, and I'm sharing it with all of you. And there's not really another way of doing it for yourself. So that's why I recommend this. Um, also, if you're thinking of softwares, sometimes QuickBooks has an integrated system to where you can hook up your invoices as long as you're updating them in your QuickBooks and putting the prices, sometimes your QuickBooks will auto-generate what that profit margin is or what those fluctuations are. And there's another program called Chef Tech. And Chef Tech was something I was using way back in the day. I don't know if they developed another, other, other systems um, to compete with that, but at least um, Chef Tech was cool because I just uploaded the, um, the invoices each day, and then it was updating that stuff for me as well. So anyway, this form right here is pretty simple. Um, we put the recipe name, such as marinara sauce or whatever. We put the number of portions that the recipe makes. So let's say that this recipe makes, um, let's say it's a party of 100 people, so it makes 100 portions. And let's say my serving size per per bowl of pasta. If I'm gonna put marinara sauce, it's more it's most likely gonna be about um, I'd say four ounces, a decent portion, not not a ton because four ounces is about half a cup. Um, so I'll do that. I think that my marinara sauce within my recipe of pasta, um, you know. I'm assuming, I don't know really how much it's going to cost actually. So let's leave that blank. But let's say we were to sell it um, for four ounces. Let's say we put about, that's, we're going to do 75 cents is kind of what I'm going to think it's going to cost uh, to resell. Uh, my food cost budget, I try to stick to a low food cost. So ideally, um, Ideally, I'll say 19% um, is my ideal. And that's kind of like, I try to hit it as often as possible. Sometimes it's 22%, sometimes it's 30%. And then that goes back to that other sheet that I said with the, um, the menu mix. You know, some things are gonna be 19%, which is, that's your food costs, which means that that's a higher profit margin item. But then what if some things are 40% for your food cost? So then that would be something that's a lower profit margin. So then here you put the ingredients. So let's put like, I'm gonna put tomatoes, onion, garlic, basil, And that's where I put my ingredients. Then I say how much of everything I'm putting. So actually, let's say tomatoes. I'm gonna use canned San Marzano tomatoes. Um, so let's say I use that. I might use, uh, well, this is for a hundred portions. So I'll, I don't know. Let's say I'm going to just ballparking this because I didn't actually prepare a recipe for today, but that's fine. Um, 
let's say I use 20 not number 10 cans and a number 10 can um, thing of San Marzano tomatoes, how much did I buy that number 10 can for? Because I'm gonna need 20 of them. And let's say I buy the number 10 can for, um, I don't know, let's say 12 bucks. And I'm gonna use all of the tomato. It'll automatically generate how much it, my edible portion cost is from the yield percent. So we'll work on this together because we just don't have enough time today. We have 20 minutes left. But when you're doing your recipe costing, this was just me making things up. But as we do this, you and I, let's say you have a barbecue company or let's say you have a sauce company. Each recipe that we do, we're going to have a recipe sheet and we're gonna fill it out so that we can get your actual food cost and how much you ideally should sell it for. So that is a very important form. Um, that's for, for any food business, um, you have to have it. So that is for every, all, all of you. Some of you have worked with me on it before um, you know, it takes me a while. I'm actually really bad at dictating math. So I actually rather teach you how to use the form and then you do it yourself. And then I look it over because I, I've always been that way. I never, I don't like it when I'm doing math and someone is watching me. Not that I don't like all of you, but I just, <laughs> it's like a personality thing. But that homework is extremely important and we'll go over it. We'll make sure that you have your food cost in line for the, you know, that reason that I just said before with the presentation, your menu mix has to be very healthy. We make sure that you have most of your items under the star category, and some of them might fall in other places. And then the theme of this workshop today was to talk about how to grow your business in a healthy and sustainable way. Well, that was the main thing you needed to know. That was the most important thing that you can do in your food business to grow it in a healthy and sustainable way is to know your food costs so that you're making sure that whatever extra you're going to charge, you're covering all of your costs and making a profit as you grow. And that, you know, is incredibly important, especially if you're going to do, let's say, government contracts, for example or you're gonna, um, more, more so that kind of thing. If you're doing catering or if you take on some sort of contract where they ask for proposals, because a lot of the time with, every time with the government contracts especially, you have the request for proposals. Um, that's one of our biggest opportunities, especially here in Washington DC for food sales, for consistent food sales is to be able to submit for those requests for proposals. And a lot of the time you have to compete against other businesses or every time, not a lot of the time. And those other businesses are gonna try to price you out of the deal. They're gonna you know, charge the least that they possibly can for whatever they're looking for for the food contract. So you need to make sure that you're, for example, if you're selling a box lunch, and you're charging $8.50 for it, how much is it costing you to produce that food inside of the container? How much is the container costing you? How much is it costing you to hire the person to be able to take everything to the, um, to the event or to the place wherever you sold the meals? Um, how much is that gas price? That's your full business plan. And it all starts with the food cost, right? The next things that, in, that you need to know in order to scale your business well is managing inventory. That's what this little checklist is for. Um, it's kind of representative of managing your inventory. And then binders are really important, you know, making sure in the kitchen, especially, that 
those recipes that you just costed out are available for your employees and available on hand for your, your kitchen team at all times. You have the binders with the recipes, with the procedures. That way, whenever you're training somebody, you can just open up a binder or recipe card or whatever and be like, here you go. And they will be able to see it. And then you can just delegate that job. Um, then again, you're not really going to be like, here you go. You're going to train them how to make the food. But if you hired a qualified cook, they, mo they most likely know, or they'll always know the proper cooking methods um, for different items. They'll know techniques. So really what they need from you as a business owner is the guidance as far as what's the recipe because they might make, you know, jerk seasoning way different than you make your jerk seasoning. And you can't expect them to make it the same way that you envision without that. And you can't expect to manage your inventory and your quality, your standard of quality that your customer is used to without a recipe binder. So you have to have that before you even start your business before you start it. And then as they produce it, you know, maybe they can go in and make notes if they changed a little thing or whatever. And you can go back maybe once every couple of months and just update the, the papers and the binders. Um, but they have to have that as a guidance period. Um, and then as far as inventory goes and managing inventory, we kind of covered that in the last session that we did where we spoke about um I'm gonna, I think that you all can see these saw these pictures I'm going to take this out of screen share but um for inventory management we already spoke last time about uh having the systems as far as your 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 systems in your restaurant that will connect with inventory and those are more technological things that, like I said, if you're looking for that sort of thing, speak with me through the SBDC. We'll schedule some time to kind of go over what your needs might be as far as um, setting that up, because everyone's different. You know, you might have, you might be doing online sales and you have a warehouse with a freezer. And then so you want to make sure that you can have like a scannable thing to where when somebody takes a case, you scan it and then that directly connects with your inventory system. Or you might have a restaurant where you have the, you know, whatever pars or whatever you're going to sell out that day. And that's, that's tallying out what's selling so that you can just have that inventory updated as opposed to relying on someone to like yell out 86 on time you know the the 86 something at least that way the system knows and it helps you track if your resources are being treated properly right because how many times as a chef has someone said they 86 something and then you're like no i definitely saw that in the walk-in and then you go to the walk in and you're like, here you go. Like, what are you doing? And sorry, but that's my chef side coming out. There's like so many stories <laughs> have like pop up in my head when I'm thinking I'm in service and someone's like, chef, I 86 this. I'm like, no, you didn't. So I know it in my head, but the front of house has to know it too. And then sometimes front of house, you told them like, 10 minutes ago that they 86 something and then they they sell it anyway and they come back with that whole story too and I see a lot of you kind of smiling because I know that you've lived that um, it's a very common story in the you know food industry and very similarly it's kind of the same as a sales team for wholesale companies and or even you know website sales all of when you're selling something to a customer, they want to buy it. You don't want to say, oh, sorry, I don't have it anymore. Would you like a different thing? Because as much as that is almost inevitable and it will probably happen, customers get 
very, very bummed out and disappointed when they come to your place. They were thinking about this like fried chicken sandwich like for weeks before they came to your place. They drove like an hour to go there. They probably had a bad day. You know, they stepped in a puddle. The only thing that's gonna make their day better is that fried chicken sandwich. And then they get to you and you 86 it. Would you like anything else? Right? So <laughs> that sucks. I see some of you laughing because I know that's happened to you before and people get really upset. So tracking inventory, having your systems update, making sure your customers are in the know of what's going on is extremely important for that reason. Um, I see someone ask, do you have to actually make the recipes and weigh as you go in order to figure out the yield for the ingredients? Uh, yeah, um, that's what I would recommend the most. Um, you know, think about production. Whenever you're going to write your recipes for any sort of production, I would love to say that people will weigh things out. And I actually used to have a charcuterie and we made salumi. And in salumi, when you're making a salami, you better be weighing every single thing out, especially because you use things like nitrates and things that need to be very leveled out. So things like that, then you have it by the gram because it has to be exact, exact. Um, but then when you're doing large volume production in a hotel, or in for a catering, you want to write your recipes in like quarts or, you know, quart sizes or gallons or things that are easy for someone to just scoop and put it in the pot. Uh, I would not have it done by the ounce in that, in that application because you're going to just make them crazy. I mean, people need to get in there and just start scooping things and start cooking in a, in a much larger way. But whenever you are doing the specific recipe cost, yes, if you could weigh it as you go to figure out the yield for the ingredients, that's extremely important because it'll give you something a lot more accurate. Um, and then you have the instances, especially whenever you're going to go into a co-packing situation where you're going to be producing maybe, you know, uh, 100,000 minimum. You know, you're going to be doing a run of 100,000 uh, granola bars, for example. You need to know exactly uh, how much each ingredient costs and what that weight is definitely in that application because you're doing it by such a large volume that if you have a discrepancy or yeah, if you're not charging enough for that item, you're gonna lose big time as opposed to maybe losing in, you know, when you sell 10 portions of something, you're losing when you're selling like thousands and thousands of something, right? No matter what the instance is, it doesn't matter if you're selling a taco or if you're selling you know, soup around the nation, you have to know your food costs. But yeah, weighing is very important. And then um, figuring out the yield for ingredients. Um, that's an interesting one because actually each ingredient does have a different yield. But I tend to go after probably use trying to figure 100%. There are things maybe like onions or things where you have to take the peel out. But Keep it simple for yourself and do it by 100% because you're going to have, you need to, that goes under employee training. So you need to have a good chef that is making sure that his team, her team, I'm a chef too, I always say his. So it's like her team, the chef's team, um, making sure that the team is following the directions as far as, far as like production so that you keep that yield. But yield 100% and don't complicate it because it's gonna be, it's gonna kind of make you crazy as far as the <laughs> calculating yield for every single little vegetable. Um, and it's not really too realistic in the day to day because you have different, you know, cars, different, different people doing a different thing. Um, just put it at 100%, but make sure that you're managing your team. And then, as far as team building goes, 
Um, we already spoke about this a little bit last time and the time before that, as far as how I approach team building. I tend to approach team building um, with an open finances type concept. I like to communicate to my team and my employees exactly how much we're making in a day, exactly how much we're spending in a day, what's the finances of the business look like so that they can not only trust me because that sometimes happens as a business owner is people start, I, I, I don't wanna say that they stop trusting the business owner a lot of time, but they, I wanna make sure that my team knows that I'm looking out for the best interest of everybody and that we're creating opportunity for each other as we work together. And so in a food business, that's worked for me very well because it helps people conserve their ingredients and their resources. They're not quite as wasteful because they're paying attention to the deli paper costs and the tomato costs and they're keeping each other in check. Um, but that kind of thing only happens with conversation with your team, making sure you're communicating it. And if you just don't have that type of establishment where you don't feel comfortable doing that with your employees and your team, that's totally fine. Just make sure that your recipes are correct and that you're making sure that you're, you're, you're checking in with your employees and taking inventory and managing inventory in a way to where if you see these discrepancies, you're catching it immediately. And that's the main way to grow without failing is staying on top of what's going on. Now work on your business, not in your business. I've said that a few times to you already, but work on your business. Set up your software, your admin systems, your kitchen in a way that you can zoom out and get a bird's eye view of the whole situation and actually manage your business on the day to day, not get kind of sucked into the rabbit hole of one minute thing at any given time. You know, you can always separate time out for recipe development. You can always separate time out for personal, um, personal development and knowledge. And maybe you want to explore more into the financial side and learn a little bit more about accounting and all of those things. You can separate time out for that. But in the day to day, you should be delegating these things out and making the systems proper and correct so that your employees can, can continue on with them and continue making a profit. But as I said, that entire profitability of food goes back to your menu mix and your food cost. Um, that's the genesis of it. And it doesn't really, you know, I would rather you use technology to really, really, you know, make it be extremely successful. But even if you decide not to invest in the technology, the least you can do is know the costs and develop a proper menu mix. Um, so that was, that was today. I was talking about, you know, how to scale sustainably. I hope that I covered things that are useful for everybody. I know that I repeated a lot of, of things for a lot of you that are already working with me through the SBDC. Um, but does anybody have any questions right now as far as what I just spoke about or even the past two ones? Carolina, how can we get this um, this form that you have that you just showed that you've had for decades? <laughs> <laughs> so we, since you're part of this, you should already be part of the DCSBDC program. So let me actually share my screen with my contact information and just send me an email and then I can send it to you. And also maybe uh, we can schedule some time for us to work on it together. Um, you can DM me or actually my email's not up there. Oh, I'm so sorry. Let me actually share that as well because it's actually it's carolina at foodbizmentor.com. So let me write that down real quick. Or can they see the chat, Charles? Uh, yes. Yeah. 
Okay. I could type it in there for you if you want. Yeah, it's Carolina at foodbizmentor.com. And you can also DM me, like I said, I actually have uh, a few of you that have DM me and I promise, promise, promise that I'll email you back. Um, this week has been pretty wild, but I will email you back and we can set up a time. You can email me here and I um, help you through the DCSBDC. So since you're part of it, we schedule some time, I go over it with you. And then we can also talk about um, purchasing. And I know that Carlos, uh, we were talking about popular food items last time. So um, you can, you know, just remember that I can help you with not just the food costing thing, but also the whole menu development. One, one other question in reference to the percentages that you talked about in reference to food costs. You said you kept yours between 19 and, and 25 or 30 percent, you said? I try not to go above 22. Um, it depends on the type of food business that I'm doing. I try to stick at 19 as much as possible because especially in Washington, D.C., where there are so many other costs that have nothing to do with the food that I need that profit margin to be able to cover the you know excessive rent that there is and the um, like labor costs that there are and all of those other things that I can't control. I need to account for that. So it makes me have to keep my food cost budget super low. And we can work on that as well. Um, but anything above 22, is is dangerous waters unless you have a strategy to how you're gonna how you're gonna make it work and that's why we also build the business plan and we do those financial projections but yeah 19 is 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 where i try to keep it and that's what you would consider uh in because every what happens when you have or is that more for a carry out or like a fast food situation when you have a chef that has daily specials, when you have a chef that does weekly specials, or if you're changing the menu every two weeks, um, and and now of course with with the cost of goods just going skyrocketing, um, how, is that is that the same uh, spreadsheet that you use? And and when you talk about the um, this, these other fees that, that are there, uh, do you have something that integrates that as well? In the end, I what I what I used to do was just do a, a daily uh, break-even point that it included electric use, water use, labor, uh, inventory, food inventory, wine inventory. My break-even at one point was seventeen hundred dollars, so I had to no matter what make that seventeen hundred week. I mean, I'm sorry, daily to be able to be you know, to break even. Yeah. Um, do you have a system that integrates all of that or, or, or a sheet that you may use? Yeah, so just kind of like I, I mentioned before, there are different softwares that can integrate that. This sheet right here is really important for the chef. Any food business, you can have a break even point. Let's say you say that uh, your break even points at 1700 or, or 17,000, whatever it is. Your food costs though, that's something you can control and that's gonna influence that break even point. So um, even if it's a special, no matter what it is, you can control what you're gonna offer to the customer before you put it on your menu. And if you can, I mean, food is all about strategy and imagination and you know, the percentage itself, I don't compromise that. I need that, you know, I need to be able to make that profit that um, to be able to, you know, influence all of those things that I need to pay. Um, so really that has a lot to do with, with the chef. And, and that's something that um, we can talk about further. You know, just you and I, we can meet about that and figure out how do I maintain that food cost consistently uh, with whoever I hire to do it, because it doesn't matter if it's a special, you should still be looking at what that food cost is. And this Excel spreadsheet 
it's blank. So you can save it and you can always use it. Um, but then you can, like I said, in the last, last session and then um, all over this session, is that there are many, many softwares out there that integrate all of those costs. It's just about what's going to be best for your business. And that's what we can kind of analyze when we're working one on one to make sure that you are making the right recommendations because there's just so many of them that um, it takes a, you know, a little bit more of a conversation to figure out what exactly what exact software I could I could uh, recommend. But that that spreadsheets like the simplest form of being able to make all of that happen on the day to day. I hope that answered your question. One, yeah, it did. Great, thank you. And and your again, the email is uh, Carolina at foodbiz.net. I'm I'm sorry, foodbiz foodbiznet.com. No, it's foodbizmentor.com. Mentor. Okay. Yes. Mentor. Okay. At foodbizmentor.com. It, it's in the chat. Yeah. Okay, got it. And then one one last question that's off this topic here. Um, I'm, I'm loving everything that the both of you are doing here, uh, Charles as well. Um, so I I I shut down my restaurant and I'm recently looking for spaces, and I'm discovering that. Uh, uh, do, do you have a? Will you ever consider a, something like this in reference to how to deal with landlords? Um, aside from the fact that you're going to have a, a, a broker that usually helps you out. The problem I'm seeing out there is that the broker, it's obviously a whole new map right now, a whole new experience because of COVID. And a lot of the rents and, and, and leasing procedures that, that are being practiced right now haven't changed. So when you do your projections, you're looking at the heavy rents that DC uh, landlords are asking for. And in reality, when you make your projections, it really makes no sense of doing business in DC. Is there something that you have uh, planned maybe for the future, one of these uh, uh, classes that you're doing, or, or do you have a system in place that would, that would help uh, navigate or even have a, an inventory of, of places or landlords that, that may, you know, uh, start understanding exactly what's going on in there before you're doing these leasing situations? Because once you get into that contract, once you get into um, personal guarantees and, and the, the market being the way it is because of COVID, um, I'm not seeing... I, I've been in business in DC for a long time, but right now I'm, I'm, you know, the considerations are outside of the district because of it, and and there is no representation for that right now of anyone that can kind of plead the the the, the this deal and and understand that the, the few restaurateurs that that kind of know what they're doing at this point in time, it doesn't make sense to go in there because of the heavy rents, the taxing. Um, and then, and, you know, again, no representation. There's a lot of help that's being uh, provided out there, but all of that help comes with strings attached. It makes no sense. Do you have, or will you, or can you um, put a workshop together on how to deal with all of that? We, we've actually had a couple uh, workshops that we've, um, that we've recommended or at least put information out about. And a lot of those come through DC Bar Pro Bono in terms of commercial okay. leasing and so on. Um, you may also want to check with, if you're affiliated with the Chamber of Commerce, let your concerns be known there because Chambers of Commerce are a good way collectively to let a specific industry know and they can, they can convey that information. You may also want to check if you're in a specific ward, convey that to your uh, ward council member too. Okay. Um, so there's a combination of things to do that you could do potentially to to uh, affect the situation. Yeah, I've worked with a lot of uh, restaurants kind of facing the same thing. And I've been working on that for years um, because you're right that the rising rent costs have made it very difficult to be able to design a viable food business in DC. And it's been something that the, um, the you know, DSLBD and different council members and Made in DC and other organizations 
that um, they've been working together and I've been super involved in that. So if we're able to work through the DCSBDC, we can figure out how, you know, exactly like your menu, um, how profitable it can be, you know, what, you know, make sure that the design is right, that the concept is right and work with those other organizations that we partner up with, that we work with to make those connections. But it is very important and it's very important to work with an experienced broker. Um, we you know, can't recommend one for you, but you can do the research and, you know, and I can guide you in, you know, what to look at when you're looking for a location. Um, and, but those things are very, you know, like, like Charles just said, the DC bar pro bono, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, program that we've been able to work with as far as making sure that your, your legal stuff when it comes to those lease negotiations, right? And I can help you in the business side to make sure that we can um, cover all those costs and make a profit and open your business in DC. That's been a huge, I mean, that's why I do what I do because it's, um, it's incredibly important. I love DC, but it's, it's more competitive and it's, it's, it's something that takes some planning. Okay. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Great. We'll tell you what folks, we're a little bit over our time, um, but want to thank everyone who attended the webinar today and I especially want to thank uh, Carolina for putting this three part series together. This is the last of the three parts. I should say this isn't the last time we're going to do this series. We're definitely going to do this again um, and appreciate everybody participating today. And, and as Carolina said, um, encourage you to follow up with her, um, to connect with her, and um, definitely any questions that we can't answer today, um, she'll be available to help you uh, after that. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Charles. Thank you for participating. I'm looking forward to seeing you all one-on-one, -on -one, but it really warmed my heart to see so many familiar faces and so many new faces and even people from other programs that you know I was part of. So thank you. And we're gonna continue to schedule these um, hopefully monthly. So uh, we'll keep you posted. Thank you so much for being here.